Hey everyone, welcome or welcome back to uh, MBA Spotlight hosted by GMAT Club 2021. So we did a consulting industry panel last week, uh, which was very popular. We got a ton of questions and uh, got a ton of great responses. So we wanted to follow it up with the other side of the coin, also pro probably just as popular, the tech industry panel. So we have uh, four of us and myself, I also work in tech, um, in this room, so we have Sophia, Jenna, DJ, and Parijat. Before we jump into questions, before we you know, talk about tech and PM and finance and big data and all of those things, I wanna quickly go around the room and introduce themselves. So Sophia, wanted to start with you, focus on what you're doing right now, which MBA program did you go to, and any interesting things that you do when you're not teching out. Hi, it's so great to be here. Thank you for having me. I am an entrepreneur and I'm onto my second company and it's called Tech for Non-Techies. And my aim is to help smart non-technical professionals get into the world of tech and dominate. So my background is a non-technical founder. So I started my career in media, then private equity, and I got my MBA at Chicago Booth. And then I started a tech company as a non-technical founder, I was really struggling. And as I learned on the job, I wrote about what I was learning in the Financial Times and in Forbes, and Tech for Non-Techies was born out of that. And for those of you who are going to be going to London Business School, you might be taking my Tech for Non-Technical Founders course. So I look forward to seeing you there. And what am I doing when I'm not teching? Well, during the, during the pandemic, I've been living in the South of France where I have been perfecting my French. So now we can talk about tech in English, in Russian, and in French, it's not about. That's fantastic. What about you, Jenna? Sure, well, I can't say I've picked up a new language uh, during quarantine, but um, I do paint, which I guess you can see one of my paintings um, to start off with. That's something that is a little more creative that I enjoy. But in terms of my background, I worked at Macy's for four years as a buyer before business school. So I have a strong retail background. I entered business school to pivot um, and I was really determined to go to a company that was proactive about change, cutting edge. And so tech for me was what I recruited and went all in on during my first year of my MBA. I interned in a strategy role at Salesforce over the summer, virtually last summer, and I will be rejoining Salesforce actually in two weeks um, for that same strategy role. All the best for that. The first few days are always like the weirdest research when trying to get the lay of the land. Uh, that happened to me, I think, like a year ago where I just joined uh, a big tech company similar to Salesforce right out of my MBA. DJ, you're up next. What are you doing? Yeah, so I currently uh, work for Microsoft. I just graduated from uh, Georgetown University MBA program on the business side. Um, my journey in technology was probably a little bit more unique than everybody else's. Uh, I was actually a former professional football player, um, was always kind of really into technology and um, but not so more on the development side. I was always kind of intrigued by the business aspect of it. So um, kind of like Sophia, um, during my downtime, I run a nonprofit that helps recent college graduates that are looking to get in technology that might not be as technical. Um, I've been doing technical sales for almost a decade, which sounds crazy now. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I love technology, love helping people out and um, huge sports fan coming from a sports background myself. And um, I just love everything data and AI and big data and technology. So excited to be on the panel. Awesome. Thanks, TJ. What about you, Parijat? What are you up to? So right now, I would say I'm lucky to be just relaxing uh, just before joining Amazon for their full time role. So I recently graduated from the Foster School of Business uh, where I pursued my full time MBA. Uh, and just before that, I was predominantly working in data science, uh, mostly helping people and businesses build products using machine learning and AI. Um, but what kind of like pushed me to pursue my MBA was kind of my failed startup. Me and my friends, we were trying to really build a product back home in India and help recruiters quickly analyze profiles on uh, LinkedIn. Um, so in the fun bit, what do I do for fun? Uh, I practice a lot of yoga. I'm certified to teach yoga. And uh, right now with the University of Washington, I'm also doing a bit of research on yoga and how it can kind of help uh, increase productivity in the workplace. So that's a bit of fun and 
work while being full time employed. Awesome. Uh, cool. Uh, I am. I'm excited to get started with this panel. We have a ton of diversity here. I think. I think one of the things that that came up in the consulting panel last week, and you guys all went to business school, so you're, I'm sure you're familiar with the consulting uh, process. Uh, the consulting process is fairly structured. Like regardless of whichever company you go to, you're probably working on a very similar entry level consultant type of a role. But tech is very different. Like, for example, you can be a product manager, you can be a marketer, you can be in finance, you can be in ops, strategy. There are so many different things. So I wanted to start with you, Sophia. So when somebody who is not necessarily a techie, right, comes to you and says that, hey, I want to go to business school and I want to get a job in tech. I'm, maybe I'm not like 100% certain on what's the job that I want, but help me figure that out. So. What are some of the questions do you ask them and how do you start with that process? So that's a great question because actually that's a very, very uh, frequent question that I get because I right. think, uh, you know, a few years ago, the creme de la creme was going to, uh, out of MBA grads, was going into banking and consulting. And now I would argue that the cool kids want to get into tech. But they don't necessarily know what they want to do. They just know that there's interesting stuff out there and they just want to get in. And stock um, options. Exactly. So um, in general, what I suggest to them is the product management role is a good way to get in there. But also there are other different, there are different ways to get into the tech industry without actually working on the tech products. So for example, if you were working in strategy consulting before, you can start working on strategy in a tech company. And then that way you are still participating in the tech boom, but you don't necessarily have to completely retrain. Another thing, so actually uh, on the Tech Fun and Techies podcast, I often speak to people who have MBAs and who transitioned into product management or who transitioned into user experience. So this is, those are quite frequent journeys. And so essentially what I, what I generally see is that if somebody is very curious about people and if somebody enjoys speaking to people, then something very user-facing, so a user research role, user experience role, or a role that, that requires product management, that's going to be really, really useful for them. However, if it's somebody who wants to work in tech, but actually what they really love is numbers, then a UX role, product management, probably not for them because that role requires speaking. But why not get into, say, data science? Why not get into just working in a finance company in a tech right. business? I think same question for you, DJ. You mentioned you're in the AI and the big data space, right? And, and you're in a kind of a non-development role. How did you figure out that's what you wanted to do? And how much did you have to, you know, learn new techniques to get that job? Um, that's a great question. I think for me, a lot of times I see people that feel like, you, you know, you got to be a software developer to Sophia's point. You got to know how to, you know, make things and you, you got to have a deep technical kind of aspect. Um, I've never been like the most technical person, but I got I got great people skills. Um, I love to make connections. I love networking. Um, so for me, I just kind of started to search like, okay, how can I be in technology without having to be a software developer and coding all day, every right. day. And I saw right. that as much of a need as it is it for, for people to, you know, build new products and solutions, you've got to have people that can sell them. So I really kind of started to research, you know, tech sales, business development, account management, like what does that actually look like? And I started to see that there were, there was a really, really like a niche market for someone with my skill set. Mm -hmm. So I started to talk to people and I was like, wow, like everyone kind of had the same kind of feedback. They were like, you know, it's great to have a great solution in the software, but if no one knows about it, it's not going to matter. So I think at the core of every single company is a great, you know, product development team. But what makes that company great is the people that can actually get that product out in front of the people and the customers and actually help them use it to solve issues. Because that that's what technology is about at the end of the day is helping solve problems. Yeah, I think, think that's a super, super solid point. And I hear that even when, you know, like people who are 10 levels above our pay grade talk about 
uh, enterprise software as well. I think I was talking, I was listening to this podcast and Sundar Pichai was talking about one of the things that he wished he hadn't done was when, when, when Google Cloud was just getting built, uh, Google was following a similar approach to consumer processes. They did not have as many salespeople on the field. They did not have as many account managers. And they were hurt by that, which is, you know, like they, they, they got in like Oracle people and actually have made like a pretty formidable sales team. So I totally hear what you're saying. Jenna, uh, you you were doing strategy at Salesforce, right? Which, which is also something Sophia alluded to. Um, I'm a product manager. Like I work with like super technical products. I have no clue what a strategy person does. Can you tell me what you did over the summer and like, what's your full-time role uh, going to look like? Sure, I can absolutely elaborate on that. So I can say my official title is business value consultant. It's within the sales organization. It was a function I was not familiar with at all before business school. And similar to what we've talked about before, and DJ, you touched upon too, I was trying to leverage my retail experience and the things I enjoyed about it. So I love working with different brands and building the strategy of those brands and how we could present them at Macy's. I love working with the different cross-functional teams to really have that brand come to life online and in store. And so when I was looking for roles within tech, I was trying to find internship opportunities that would highlight those functional experiences that I had uh, from my previous working life, but in a tech company. And for big tech, what I realized and advice that I'd had from, from Stern alums is to try to find those roles that really meet those functional um, qualifications. And, and that's what I'd most likely convert to big tech with my background. Anyway, so uh, Value Consultant is in the sales org. And essentially, I, for the more strategic accounts, will build a business case as to why customers should invest with Salesforce. And so it's actually quite similar to consulting in that um, I will do a deep dive with some of our potential customers, talk through what their pain points are, some of the key metrics that they're looking to impact. And then on my own, I will go back and think through what the Salesforce product is and how we could best address that. I would partner right. with um, a solutions engineer who will tailor the demo and product for a presentation and then ultimately present an ROI business case to the C-suite level as to why they should invest in Salesforce. How is Mark Benioff in person? I would I would love to know um, because I was virtual last summer and I'm starting virtually. I, I can't Thanks. say. Um, I have heard he's quite a big presence in, in person as well. Um, and actually when I was doing prep for my interviews last year, um, I read his book, which is a, a little piece of advice if you're interviewing for any of the big tech companies and the founder or CEO has a book out, I would strongly recommend reading it. I think it's a nice brush off the shoulder when you can say in your interview um, that you, you read the founder's book and can really get excited about the company. Awesome. Paraja, you, you just graduated from uh, UW. So let me ask you this. Did you know you wanted to get into tech when you went to your MBA? And then when you did figure that out, what were the options that you were seeking? And how did you make that pivot? And how did you, and what was the journey like? So I'll be honest uh, and confess, like I did not know what I wanted to be when I came That's for my perfect. business. Like, right? um, so I knew that I wanted to try out new things uh, and branch off from what I've previously experienced. Um, tech, obviously, as a product manager, that was something very tangential and very close to what I could get. Um, but I did apply for a lot of consulting, a lot of um, NGOs. I tried to work with the Gates Foundation uh, before at least um, joining Amazon. So that way I was able to quench my curiosity of like having all of that exposure. But what pushed me to go to tech and mostly to Amazon as a product manager was like the whole internship experience. Uh, I felt like as a product manager, yes, uh, we are mostly focused on developing the product, but that is not what we do on a daily basis, right? You have everything, right? You're, you're controlling from finance to accounting to even something like sales, marketing and all of that, right? So that 
it, that entire experience made me realize that okay this is something maybe that will help me be the master of all things right uh, and maybe not <laughs> uh, and that is why like even today i have gone and pursued for full time like joining amazon as a product manager technically Yeah no i i echo that i've been product managing for almost two one, a year and a half now and i think there's like a solid misconception that product managers are like mini ceos of their product that is just so not true like i have no power uh but i, I just need to like walk through this lane of ambiguity every single day and hoping i don't die um but no that's 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 pretty awesome um Sophia when you talked about you know all these different careers in tech um do you see people who are like adamant on specific things like no you know what i have to do marketing or or i have to be on the business side of things how do you deal with that do you think tech kind of offers you this big chance of doing something totally different uh from what you did before your mba because i know that's a thing for consulting right like i have seen teachers becoming consultants i have seen you know uh retail folks becoming consultant tech folks becoming consultant so it seems like there is no entry barrier um to becoming a consultant like as long as you know like you're sharp you are great at case interviews and you know you're kind of um in love with yourself a little bit but other than that like what about tech i feel tech has a higher barrier of entry because at, as jena was mentioning like if you're going to apply for a strategy role or something like that there are some ways where you have to tie in your past experiences so i wanted to know what your experience has been on that well um i can tell you a story that i think demonstrates it and if you want to listen to the full thing uh yeah. there was an interview with this person on the techno techies podcast her name is juliet and she started her career as a journalist so definitely non technical she was not covering tech at all so literally a news reporter for the telegraph which is one of the largest newspapers in the uk and then she she was working you know newspapers in, in general, journalists have to upload their stories onto their own kind of back panel and she started suggesting changes to the back panel um to these people who were kind of at the end of email she didn't know what who they were but then right. these people these mysterious people the product team started saying that oh this is this is an interesting person she is giving us feedback and then somehow basically julia started working more and more with them and then once she understood what they were doing she got really interested in product management and when a product management role opened up within the product team they literally asked her to apply and she said yes and now she's working at the same organization as a product manager now when i asked her what did you have to learn about technology uh, by the way she actually is one of my students so i do know what she had to learn about technology but also there's obviously networking in that but i think the main point is she knew the user because the product team is making the newspaper digital product for readers but also for journalists so for journalists right. on the go so for example a journalist just got some breaking news they need something super easy and super simple to upload the story so they can be the first to break it ahead of their competitors juliet knows exactly how to do that so i would say if you want to work in product management you need to understand the users so this is why i do actually think that you have people from all sorts of backgrounds getting into product management because for example if you have worked in a school and you're making a product for schools you uh, you potentially have the skills to be a great product manager for that product whereas if you know right. everything about technology but you don't know anything about your user you're going to be pretty replaceable that makes sense uh, it also you know i think one of the so i i went to the university of michigan a couple of years ago and uh, i didn't have a lot of tech things in my background but uh, mostly engineering stuff but i did teach in a school for like two full years and i pivoted to ed techy things which has actually got me my job as a pm at apple which is very similar to your story because there was they were hiring me for apple classroom uh which you know like you have to kind of know how a classroom works if you want to be the pm of a product that's called classroom um 
Cool, awesome. DJ, I wanted to ask you a, a question that we are getting from, uh, from the viewers. Um, what is the big issue with tech, especially for people um, you know, who have not been in the tech industry before, is just getting familiar with, uh, with jargon, right? Like, I'm not gonna ask you or anyone in the panel what a REST API is, but how do you get over that? Like you're in the AI big data space. So I am, I am strongly guessing you're talking like, you know, statistical significance, you're talking P P50, you're talking Azure and big data and IoT and all of these jargony looking things. Okay, first of all, how many jargons are there and how long did it take for you to learn them all? But second, <laughs> how did you navigate that process after joining um, Azure AI? Um, so I got a mentor, he's been in the industry, I think for over like 30 years. Um, and something that he told me is, you know, flexibility and like kind of like an eager, eager to learn, right? So as far as the jargon, I learn something new every day. Like oh, I didn't know the acronym stood for that. Now there's the yeah. basic that I feel like you have to know. Um, something that I did when I was really kind of making the move from cybersecurity to big data um, is I leveraged LinkedIn, right? Like you can follow hashtags uh, for AI, machine learning, big data, SQL, like all that kind of stuff that aligns with the industry. Um, and literally when you're on LinkedIn, it's on your newsfeed. So you're seeing it in real time. There's a use case that just came out for, you know, financials or, you know, something that they're doing as far as building out cities with, I, with IOT. So um, you can literally learn kind of on your own, just subconsciously with putting it in front of you every single day. But also I feel like you shouldn't put that much pressure on yourself to know everything about all the stuff all at once. Like technology is forever changing, forever evolving. There's probably something that's being created right now for big data that I'm not going to know about probably until like three months later. And there's nothing wrong with that. I think as long as you're eager to learn, you have a growth mindset, you'll be completely fine. So I wouldn't worry so much about knowing everything all at once. I will focus more on for the listeners is just learn, be eager, be eager to learn and just know that, you know, it's a, it's a marathon, right? Like you're not going to know everything tomorrow and you shouldn't want to know everything tomorrow. That's the fun about technology. It's changing right. into something new. But you know what so I add to that right, ahead, is, is that I think business schools, most business schools don't actually have a specific course or they don't make a specific effort to teach you this stuff. So, for example, I mean, I went to Chicago Booth, very good school. But when I came out with my MBA and my $180,000 worth of debt, I <laughs> still didn't know basic things. Like, I didn't know what a tech stack was. I, like, I didn't know this phrase. I didn't know just some basic things like what is an API? Yes, I knew about the strategy of tech companies, but that's not very useful when you're actually thinking of making a product. So while DJ is completely right in saying that, don't put all this pressure on yourself because you're not going to learn everything anyway. Like I don't think Mark Zuckerberg knows everything. I think it's kind of impossible. But I do think that when you're going into business school, even when you're going into the top ones, you do need to be a bit careful about the fact that MBA schools are still focused on consulting and they're still focused on banking. So if you want to get into tech, you do need to make a bit more of an effort because there probably isn't going to be a specific class to teach you this. Thing. So and I, and, I, and I think to that point, Sophie, is like when I say like a growth mindset, there's a lot of courses online, like Coursera has a ton of classes on big data, things like that. So you kind of got to take it upon yourself to know like, hey, I really got to kind of go the extra mile to make sure that I'm ready if, if this is the industry that I really want to be in. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You have to take, you have to, you can't expect that the business school is going to give it to you. So come to Tech on Techies, listen to the stuff for free on the podcast or come to the courses or get the books, do whatever, but you do need to create your own curriculum and not just rely on the business school to feed you the information and then just be ready for the job. Because yes. in general, if you just leave it and you're going to the product manager interviews, you basically left it too late from what I've seen. I think one sorry. of the, uh, I think sorry, the, sorry. The, big, the big takeaway from what I heard is you don't have to know everything, which is very reassuring. Uh, Parajal, I'm going to get to you real quick. Um, but I think one of the things that tech is different from, from other areas of business school recruiting, 
like the ones that you mentioned, Sophia, like you know, banking and consulting and all, and all of these things. Um, there are alternative ways to get to tech roles, even if you don't do an MBA, right? Uh, like for example, the jobs that all of us have right now, we didn't need an MBA to get there, um, but not true for consulting and banking for which MBA is almost like a inevitable prerequisite, right? So I, so I feel like that speaks to your point for both of you that even if you get in an MBA program, that doesn't necessarily mean you have checked that this box that they're looking for. So you have to go out of your way to you know, lo lo learn new things. Like the other thing that I wanted to also mention, we've been getting some product management questions on the side. So I kind of interviewed for every single product management the interviews that I could get my hands on. And one of the things that they, they, there's often a technical round, especially at companies like Google and Microsoft, they both have pretty strong technical rounds. And I, I see often a mistake that, that, that people make is that, okay, let me learn everything there is to know about tech this one night where like people have spent like, you know, postdoctorate degrees on computer science. Let me just learn everything. Let me just, you know, like Tony Stark this tonight. Uh, and, it's, and it's just not going to happen. And, and when what I've seen interviewers do is I'm going to focus on your experience and try to ask you, do you understand the tech of your experience or do you understand the tech of everyday products in a way where you would be able to talk to engineers when you do this job? And I think doing that in a jargon-free way was a lot more meaningful than understanding how load balancers work. All right, so I just wanted to throw it out there because I was uh, getting these questions on the comments. Parijat, I feel like I've rudely interrupted you twice now. So the floor is yours, man. Wait, what was the question? I don't know. I think you were saying something, and, but, I, oh, and, but, I, but I went on to talk about something else. I don't know. Uh, so I was just going to like second Sophia uh, about the fact that like in business school that yes, you are taught a lot about product management and different skill sets that helps you become a better manager and executive. Uh, but on the field, if you look at like any internships that you do right out of business school, it's very hard to like, there's a monumental project that is given to you in a span of 12 weeks you're supposed to solve. And there is no way that you can learn all of those knowledges, right? It, even though if you spend those 12 weeks, like 24 hours a day. So the best advice that was given to me by my mentors in Amazon was never be scared to ask a question. So always ask questions. And that is the only way to learn, especially in the uh, field and in the business school. So that's it. That's all I had to say. <laughs> awesome. that's yeah, no, I to the, totally agree. Yeah, um, sorry, say, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say that that's quite, con that humility is I think quite contrary to what you would get in the business schools, because I don't know about you, but Everybody in the business schools that I've been in, you know, either teaching or learning, it's like, I am the smartest person and I know everything. And you're kind of not supposed to, to admit any vulnerability, whereas I think if you want to succeed as a non-techie in tech, you actually do have to be very open about what you don't know and ask questions rather than, I have a PowerPoint and I have the answers. Precisely. It's precisely. kind of like this opposite thing of the interview. I think in interviews, you clearly try to show you're smarter than you actually are. Oh, but I think the, the day you get your job, I think that's where the honesty needs to start, like day one. That's when it's too late. Yeah, you're right. Cool. Uh, Jenna, I, I, I wanted to go a little bit clinical on how tech interviewing, how to actually get that job. And I wanted to start with you, like while it's still fresh, uh, walk us through the recruitment process. Like how did you, like you talked about Salesforce and uh, business value consulting as thing that you had in so maybe some prior background, but tell me a little bit more about that interview process. How often, I know networking is a big part of tech recruiting, right? Uh, I, I know Microsoft is big on networking on campus. I'm sure so was Salesforce. Uh, walk us through the process, the interviews and, you know, resume, what all did you have to do to get that job and how can people follow your success? Sure. So I can start off by saying, similar to what we've talked about from a classes perspective, recruiting for tech with your, an MBA program is a lot messier and less clear yeah. than consulting and banking. In, in more traditional industries, you have a company comes on campus, they do a corporate presentation. You might schedule on-campus coffee chats, which are formalized and 
pre-COVID hosted in person on campus. And then over winter break, those companies will come in and give out interviews in, right. in the actual school building. And then two or three weeks later, they give out offers. And it's a pretty regimented standard program of affairs of, of giving out offers. Tech is a mix. There are some companies for some roles that have started following that regimented program. So for example, Amazon has a really big presence at NYU. And until COVID, they were very regimented about they released applications at a certain date, they closed them at a certain time, you heard about interviews, and then they hosted on campus interviews uh, within a certain time frame. That being right. said, there's so many companies that are much less formalized. And it's challenging when you are with peers who a lot of your classmates are doing more traditional recruiting to to want to you know have tech meet that same regimented approach. And you just can't necessarily do that. So there is roles at Salesforce, at Google, at Facebook that some of them were posted in September before consulting roles, but then they also had new listings in May last year. And it's on a rolling basis. A lot of them are a lot more fluid and less regimented than the consulting and banking companies, which is great for long term, I think, going into tech. One of the most appealing parts about it um, is how fast paced and evolving the companies can be. But when you're recruiting and you're trying to keep a more formalized process, it's it can be challenging. Yeah. Um, but what I would say is the corporate presentations, most schools have relationships with the larger tech companies. Um, attend all those presentations, learn as much as you can. I know at NYU, they usually would bring in a couple of alums who are at those companies to talk to and speak with. Um, those were really great information sources when it came down to actually interviewing to say, you know, I've spoke to a real person. I don't just read about your tech company in the news. Um, but I, I had a real conversation with someone using some of that can go a long way. Um, the other big piece for tech that I would suggest, and that's something now if you're in the process of going to school in the fall or, or thinking about um, getting your MBA soon, is referrals are a really big part of tech recruiting. And so while referral won't help you actually get the job, the hardest part about tech from my experience is actually getting the interview. You have thousands of applicants, especially for MBA programs, where there might be a smaller scope of MBA specific tech roles. And how yeah. do you get yourself out of the slush pile? And referrals at the big companies will at least almost guarantee that a recruiter will look at it and respond. And whether that means yeah. you get a rejection in a week um, at least you, you have that. And so thinking through, and I know for referrals, it wasn't just MBA contacts that I used. I had high school friends or my friend's neighbor and had a quick call with them and then they were able to put me down. It was relatively low touch, um, but it's a small thing that can go a long way. Yeah, no, I totally agree on the referrals bit. I think, I think Amazon and Google have like a very established campus recruiting policy, but I think for every single other tech company, I had to go through referrals. But I wanted to follow up also, um, Jenna, like, okay, so you get these referrals and you get an interview. What mm -hmm. happens next? Or, or what happened with you? And I'm going to ask the panel questions around their interview experience as well. Yeah, so my process was a little long, um, but I had, I think, which is pretty standard though for general tech companies, is I had a phone screening with a recruiter. And basically, she asked the classic tech questions Have I worked with data? Um, how have I done different analyses? Cross collaborated. Uh, and then once I passed that vetting, I had met one on one with a few different uh, value consultants within the team. Um, right. And then something Salesforce does, and it, it I, I want to say there's other companies that do it. I can't think of any off the top of my head, but it's a um, panel presentation. And so I was given a case and then uh, a week to create a presentation and then presented that presentation to a panel of 10 to 15 value consultants. And I was, it was a role playing type role. So I was pretending to be a value consultant at Salesforce and I was presenting to a C-suite panel. Um, 
What I will say, I think one of my takeaways from that, though, is I had to create a very complex financial model, which I had very little experience with um, from school and then in life before that. I also had never made PowerPoints for professional purposes. Um, and so I really leaned on my peers to help me with some of that prep work. So one of my investment banker friends met with me and, and gave me a three hour lesson on a Saturday on how to model. Um, and then one of my ex consulting friends sat down and said, you know, here's how you can align things on your slides to make it look pretty and things like that. Um, and then the other piece was speaking to other interns who from previous years who had successfully converted their interview uh, to a right. full time internship is speaking with, with them about what they did well and some of their their learnings. Parja, does that align with your interviewing experience or was it totally different? I would say it was a bit different for uh, us. I right. usually in yes. Washington, right? Yeah. So within our university, our career management, I believe, because we are presented in the West Coast, uh, is deeply connected with all the companies in the tech world. So for us, at least all of these major tech companies uh, would have a systematic uh, interview process where they would come to the university and interview all of these students. Um, so from, from my internship experience, what we used to do is we used to just give our resume to our career management and just tell them that these are the companies we want to get into. And if the resume is picked by the recruiters in the, their teams, they would just call us for the interview, which would happen in the uh, career management center. Right. So yeah. that was, yeah. So that was pretty, like pretty bad for us, like at least in terms of the tech interview process, but I would not say that for all startups that exist in the West coast, uh, that was the case. Uh, yes, in the more formalized big companies like uh, Google, Facebook, you have that access, but um, smaller companies in Seattle and even in the Bay Area, uh, they had their own process where again, you have to go through the standard process of like meeting them either offline or online right. in one of those things. So it was a little bit different. That's what I would say. What about you, DJ? How was the Microsoft recruiting process? Um, similar to Jenna's experience, I had to go through what's called a loop, but it was yeah. interesting. They, so Microsoft has kind of changed their interviewing process. It wasn't as long, but I just remember being in interviews for almost like eight hours for the entire day. So wow. I had to, because I was going for a big data business development role, I had to do a SWOT analysis, um, which was great because obviously I'm a business guy coming from the NBA. So that was helpful. Um, I had experiences doing PowerPoints and things like that. So I really thrive on like public speaking and really breaking stuff down by the numbers. So I had to do a presentation for the panel on that. Um, but ironically enough, so I went through this like kind of like quick interview process, but there wasn't a role for me at the time. They were like, hey, because of your location and where you're at, um, we'll, we'll put you kind of like a waiting list. So I actually got hired. Uh, by another big data company was working there. And then uh, Microsoft kind of came back and was like, hey, we got this perfect role for you right now. Um, no need to interview again. You know, tell us what you need from us. And it kind of just went kind of from there. But it wasn't anything that was like a long drawn out process. There was some waiting time there. But ironically enough, the company that I had went to work for prior to coming to Microsoft, they were a Microsoft partner. So I was doing business with Microsoft. And it just so happened that my manager now, I was working kind of with them indirectly. They saw what I can do and they were like, hey, we really need to bring this guy over here. So it kind of worked out at the end of the day. Awesome. Um, Parajat, how was your interview experience like with Amazon? Was it similar, like uh, two rounds back to back and things like that? So I would say the in the good old days, we had about four back to back rounds uh, when right. it was mostly behavioral questions. and. Uh, fortunately, there were a few tech questions, uh, but then they were mostly around product uh, related, like product cases. Uh, mm -hmm. Otherwise, it was mostly about my experience of having work, work in tech and what were some of the nuances that I faced while building those techs. Gotcha. Awesome. Yeah, I think there were like mini tech casing type questions like, what would you do if this had happened to you? Something like that. Um, cool. I wanted to go a little bit. Um, you know, like doomsday philosophical here. Like all of us, you know, data programs and all of us agree that the MBA is just not enough. Like you have to like do your own research. You have to learn on your own. You have to go on LinkedIn. Uh, is the MBA necessary though at all? Like, um, would you guys recommend MBAs for 20 somethings who want to break into tech? What are 
some of the pros and cons of doing the MBA. So Sophia, wanted to start with you to start that discussion off. Well, this is something that I get asked a lot and something that I think about a lot because earlier to your, uh, alluding to your earlier point, you don't actually need an MBA for these roles. Mm. And in fact, some people in tech actively dislike MBAs. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I remember I was speaking to somebody who was the VP of EMEA for Twitter. He uh, He's now left. And we... Uh, and he literally said, well, you know, MBAs, they just want to come in and they just want to be the boss. But if they don't know about how anything works, then how can they be the boss of anything? Uh, which is legitimate. You know, having spent a lot of time around MBAs, we all just want to be the boss. Doesn't matter of, you know, of this pen. <laughs> so it, I do think that the MBA, um, kind of the, the brand itself, doesn't necessarily open doors in tech not all the time, the way it would do in consulting and in banking. It does sometimes. However, I don't regret my MBA. It has really given me a lot because first of all, one of the things that an MBA does is it gives you a cover for two years. <laughs> Within that, you know, whether it's a year or two years, you know, I think most people, let's be real about this, most people get into MBAs thinking that essentially I want to have a really great career, but I don't know how to do it. And I want somebody to pay me lots of money. And I don't really know how I'm going to do this. And mm -hmm. I think that if I get into this business school, then I'll figure it out. And actually, I think the business school is a good way to do it. Uh, and a continuation of that, I think product management, again, if you want to get into tech and then you don't really know what you want to do, product management is kind of like the consulting version. Um, of the job, you know, people who are not entirely sure of what they want to do. And I often see people who do product management roles and then get into venture capital. So actually, it's one of these roles that does open up many more opportunities or, you know, they become founders. However, if you're not entirely sure that you want an MBA, but you are sure you want to work in tech, then forget the MBA and just go straight to tech. You don't need the $200,000 investment let's call it that but i still definitely don't regret money i i also you know also want to point out i think in the last five to ten years because of how much tech has been hiring just in terms of sheer number of talent there are a lot of specialized programs as well like you can do a master's in science you can do a data science degree you can do a tech mba and all of those are perfectly acceptable uh, to get into tech um, as as like a opening door kind of a mechanism. But DJ, I also wanted to ask, do you agree with Sophia? Like, I mean, I don't think any of us regret our MBA, but feel free to raise your hand if you do. Um, but um, do, do you feel the MBA is necessary for the switch that you made or did it help? How much did it help? Um, I think every situation is different, right? I think you have to know, like, what do you really want out of your career, right? Like for me, you know, one day I want to be able to run a company and be a CEO of a, of a startup. So right. I need to know business for that, right? Like there's things that, that even if I'm in technology doing business every single day, there's certain things from a business perspective that I personally have to know. And then also success leaves clues, right? So if I'm looking at a lot of these CEOs, the ones that didn't start their own companies, the ones that were you know hired internally or promoted or organically came up through the ranks, a lot of them have MBAs. So it's like, you know, why try and, you know, reinvent the wheel when it's like, okay, I have I have the background from a from a career standpoint with you know working for companies like Dell, Microsoft, Apple, you know, Cloudera, but I didn't necessarily have the education piece. So for me, it was like, okay, that was the last kind of piece of the puzzle for me right. to kind of continue my own trajectory and my own vision and my own mission. Um, but only thing I feel like the con was there was a saying I was talking to my mentor, he was like, just know like the MBA is not enough, right? So for any student that's thinking like, hey, you know, I'm gonna go get my MBA to Sophia's point, I'm gonna spend all this money and invest all this time for two years, and it's gonna come out perfect on the back end. Um, it's not gonna work like that. And I see people every day that interview with Microsoft, they have they come from these great schools, you know, Yale, Princeton, you know, NY, but they're leaning so much on the MBA that they're forgetting that these companies they're looking for differentiators, right? Like what are you going to do to help us push the needle forward for our company and having an MBA 
everybody has NDAs now almost, right? So that's not going to be enough. You got to come in with a clear vision, a clear mission. What are you going to do to be a difference maker? And how are you going to help the company kind of move their mission forward? Right. Awesome. Uh, thanks so much for that. I think that's a really good perspective as well. I think MBA could be one piece of the puzzle, but not to misconstrue it as the overall puzzle itself. I think that's, that is pretty awesome. And I totally agree. Kind of, you know, um, approaching the end of the session. So I wanted to ask Jenna and Parija, two more recent MBA folks here, if you had to like do things all over again, right? Like you wanted to get into tech, but you're like a first year um, in your business school. Jenna, we'll start with you. What would you do differently? I knew there was options outside of product management, but I don't think I truly understood the scope and the breadth of opportunities for MBA roles. And yeah. I, if I, I wish looking back, you know, while I was in the recruiting process, I, I started to learn more about these different roles and I had coffee chats to explore that. But right now, if you have time over the summer, go into some, I'd make a list of what some of your top companies are and start looking through their job listings and see what kind of roles they have. Even if it's searching for MBA as a pre or pre qualification or yeah. suggested uh, suggested qualification, look and see what the roles are out there so that you can start right. tailoring if it's coursework or, or whatever it is. If you need to learn Python or Agile, whatever it might be to help you get there, I think that's a really great step to do. Um, the other thing I would say is just showing that you're excited about tech when you go into some of these networking events goes a really long way. And so, you know, the Wall Street Journal has some really great tech podcasts. There's a news briefing that I usually listen to and I walk to school every day. Um, it sounds like Sophia has a great podcast to listen to as well. Um, but just to get your feet wet in the industry and feel like you're in touch with it. And I know for me, with the retail background, I wanted to prove my that I, that I, you know, could hold my own in the tech conversation and demonstrate my interests. And so doing yeah. some of the research now, you know, if it's reading some interesting books that you're excited about, some entrepreneurs, doing that now so you can really enter the recruiting process knowledgeable on what functions you're interested, what companies, and then just general your, your tech interest. Parajad, what about you? Like if you had to do the whole thing all over again, what would you do differently? That's a very deep and interesting question. Like, honestly, I, I feel pretty proud that how things have gone. So that way, if I wanted to be in the same place, I would do the same things again. Uh, but if I, if I had a younger version of myself who I can advise, I would just say be more comfortable being uncomfortable, especially when coming to the business school. Don't be shy of like going out and meeting people and doing networking. Uh, that was something that was a bit hard for me, at least initially, and I was able to push it much more towards the end of my uh, uh, MBA experience. But had I been able to do it earlier, maybe perhaps the experience would have been much better. Who knows, right? So that, that's what I would have told myself. Yeah, I think, you know, I think every single time I've sort of asked this question to people on GMAT Club or, or otherwise, that's the feedback that I've heard as well. Like, I wish I had started networking sooner rather than waiting for these companies to come to my campus. Cool, um, that's awesome. You're kind of at the end of time. I wanted to take the opportunity to thank you guys. Everybody. I know this is a working day for all of us, but thanks a ton for being here. Uh, I think we learned a lot. And also I think the biggest layer that I wanted to peel is tech is not just you know one function or one career. And I'm so glad we got a panel where all of us are doing totally different things. Um, stay tuned for MBA Spotlight. Leave a like to this video. It helps get us to more people who are trying to break into tech as well. And I'll be in touch with you guys as a follow-up, but really, really, really grateful for you guys to spend your afternoon with us today. Sophia, that's evening for you. It is evening for me, but I'm not allowed to leave my apartment for another few days, so I can keep going. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Well, thanks, Sophia. Thanks, Jenna. Thanks, DJ. Thanks, Parija. Thank you guys so much for being here. We'll have the video forever for, for you to watch later if you cut snippets of it. And you guys have a great rest of your day. Thank, Thank you. you guys so much. Take care. Bye. Bye.